Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to our uh, expert panel on the topic of democracy. My name is Christopher Send. I'm the provost here at Lewis University, and it's my great honor to be the moderator of this panel with three um, amazing faculty members here at Lewis. This event is part of a larger effort to bring our faculty and their expertise to bear on society's most pressing questions and challenges. We take seriously our responsibility to inform both students and broader audiences about issues that impact the public good. Today, our focus is on the subject of democracy, and we have three faculty experts who will cover important topics such as access to the democratic practice, influence, and the formation of political ideology. It is a continuation of the panel we did in November related to the election, expanding some of our reflection on what it means to participate in the political process through elected government. I want to also say our decision to keep our focus here is connected to the events on and surrounding January 6th, events that in no small way have asked us to reflect more deeply on our understanding of democracy, its foundations, its rights and protections, and its potential. I should say that this is not likely to be a panel about comparative forms of government or terminologies for different forms, although that may come up. For our purposes today, democracy is a catch-all term that represents an intention by nations to give citizens the demos, power or rule, kratos. I will quickly introduce and welcome our faculty. They will each present and then uh, for five or so minutes, and then we'll have some time at, at the end for questions and conversation among the panelists. And I'll say now that um, there is a question and answer uh, box on your right, um, and you can ask questions anytime during the presentations. We won't address them until the end of the three presentations, but you can um, ask the question as it comes to you, and we'll take them in, in the order that they come through. So I'm going to give very brief biographical introductions to all three of our faculty members, and then Dr. Schultz will, will, will kick us off with the first uh, remarks. So Dr. Mark Schultz is an historian with a special interest in African-American history in the Jim Crow era. His first book, The Rural Face of White Supremacy, was an editor's choice selection of the Atlantic Monthly. He is now working on a history of African-American farm owners from the Civil War to the present. Dr. Joe Kosminski is a professor and chair of the physics department at Lewis. Though his training is in experimental high energy physics, he still, uh, and he still collaborates on experiments in, at Fermilab and with the QuarkNet group. He has interests in physics education research and in science and science education policy as well. Dr. Kozminski is also an elected official in his second year on the Naperville uh, District 203 School Board. And then finally, Dr. Uh, Lorette T. Leeson is a professor and chair of our political science department here at Lewis. Her teaching interests are political theory and public policy. She has published numerous articles and book chapters on a range of topics from feminism, evolutionary theory, and female behavior over uh, the last her 25 year career. So um, let's get started with Dr. Schultz. Mark, take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm starting off with just one of my early memories of doing research in rural Georgia. I'd done hundreds of oral interviews I, in um, many parts of the South, but I started off in one part of middle Georgia in the 1980s. And I remember talking with one elderly white planter about his memories of politics. And he shocked me by being very forthright. He uh, was a man who essentially controlled voting in his part of the county. Um, he had poor black and white sharecroppers, um, uh, day laborers who would come to him uh, with their um, uh, their ballots on election day and he'd pay them $5 a piece. They'd stand in the line on his porch and he'd you know, give them $5 and fill it out and give it back to him. And he told me, this is a direct quote, uh, some people say one man, one vote. I don't hold with that. Uh, an uneducated janitor doesn't have any business having the same political say as a educated man like me. And I was simultaneously delighted because I got it on tape and, you know, wow, that went right in the book. Um, 
but two, just shocked that he would be so open about his disdain for what I thought of as one of the principles of America, right? One man, one vote. We all get some say. And over the years of teaching at Lewis, I've been here since 1996, um, teaching uh, colonial and early national history, the, the uh, Constitutional Convention. Um, in some ways, he really does fit the long story of America. We, we started as the uh, world's largest democracy, right? The first large scale democracy ever. And we were worried about getting it right. And the founders were unsure, uh, many of them, of the worthiness of Americans to vote. Can, can democracy actually work? Uh, despite all the great language that they used, you know, about, about all men being created equal um, and endowed by their creator with inalienable rights of life, living, and pursuit of happiness, they also were concerned that democracy would fail. And they were concerned about two different things. They thought that we would fall potentially into tyranny. We are gonna fight a war for independence against Britain. They have a king, a monarchical system. Um, aristocracy was the system across Europe. And so our constitution, our bill of rights, creates all kinds of protections for individuals uh, to be guaranteed uh, rights against the power of the government and separation of powers and checks and balances and independent judiciary system. And all of that was to deal with the problem of, of tyranny, the potential problem. But the other problem that they were concerned about was what kind of person should have the right to vote? What makes a responsible citizen? Um, now, compared with everywhere else in the world that had any kind of democratic system at the time, we had a far higher percentage of our population that had the right to vote. But um, I, what in England, uh, landowners could vote, which was a very small percentage of the population. Here, far more people owned land. Um, and they started off believing that, that the right to vote should be determined by states. Local communities uh, would determine who gets that right. But at the local area, the decision tended to be toward uh, giving people who with a stake in society the right to vote. White men who own land uh, and thereby, thereby demonstrated that they were responsible citizens. Uh, very briefly, uh, New Jersey let women vote. A few northern states let uh, African Americans vote if they had uh, more property than the white property qualification. But we were at the beginning a Herrenvolk democracy, Herrenvolk's German phrase. Uh, it means a democracy of the super race, a democracy of the super people, right? Um, so we're a democracy, but one that does not let everybody have equal access to the vote. And over the course of American history, there's been a struggle back and forth between those who wanted to narrow the range of, of, of citizenship and access to democratic power and those that are trying to expand it. We get you know, the Dred Scott case where the Supreme Court said that, that black men had no rights that any white man needed to recognize. Um, Native Americans clearly were pushed aside as non-citizens. Women were covered over, is the phrase, right? Uh, femme couverte, uh, by their husband legally who would represent the family. So women didn't have to vote. It would be, be the man who votes. But over the course of the past two centuries, the groups who were left out of power kept reaching back to the founding documents and the great language of the founding documents that did say that all people should have these rights and used that as leverage to stretch democratic rights over themselves to make themselves included in this process. But it's a push-pull story that has no teleology, no inevitability that, that in the end, um, uh, everybody's going to stay enfranchised. We just had Shelby County versus Holder in 2013 that rolled back uh, voting rights for a fair number of people. So it's up to us individuals to um, shape the story, uh, to push it forward or backward. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kosminski. Thank you. Um, so democracy uh, needs fact-based decision-making and benefits from scientific progress. And likewise, scientific exploration and technological advancement thrives in a democracy. Scientific process itself, however, is not a democratic process. Facts are not generated by popular vote uh, or number of likes. 
We make discoveries through experimentation and careful observation. We develop theories and hypotheses and continue to test and refine them. If a hypothesis or theory doesn't hold up under the next experiment, we modify it based on the evidence or maybe reject it. Uh, this isn't flip-flopping. This is an evolution of our understanding based on the facts and the evidence that we've uncovered. And this is okay. No theory or law is sacred. Newtonian mechanics, the gold standard for over two centuries, needed to be expanded on by Einstein's uh, relativity theory. Galileo turned his telescope to the sky and made multiple discoveries, leading to the downfall of the Earth-centered universe in favor of a sun-centered model. We can't get hung up on a particular theory or model when new facts present themselves. The astronomer Carl Sagan reminds us, uh, quote, science is far from perfect instrument of knowledge. It's just the best we have. In this respect, as in many others, it's like democracy. Science by itself cannot advocate courses of human action, but it can illuminate the possible consequences of alternative courses of action. Democracy may not be the perfect form of government, but our democracy grew out of scientific revolution and enlightenment. Our so-called American experiment is not only grounded in basic freedoms like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but also in science. The inalienable rights that sprung from the Enlightenment philosophy are the same rights scientists need in order to share their findings without fear of repercussion. Galileo, as a result of his discoveries that flew in the face of the church, had to face the Inquisition. Uh, more recently, Dr. Fauci spoke truth to power in relaying facts about COVID-19 to the public in the midst of much inf misinformation where he and he faced ridicule and possible retaliation. Uh, Vannevar Bush, the first presidential science advisor who spearheaded the development of the National Science Foundation, uh, stated that scientific progress on a broad front results from free play of free intellects, working on subjects of their own choice in the manner dictated by their curiosity for exploration of the unknown. Freedom of inquiry must be preserved under any plan for government support of science. Scientists need the latitude and the funding to explore and advance scientific understanding, though these explorations may not pay dividends for years, if ever. And to find applications for the science and technologies, which may not be immediately apparent. Freedom is what a democracy can provide. I sometimes get questions like, why fund particle physics? And what's the top court going to do for me or humanity? Well, the answers about understanding the universe better and, and seeking the truth aren't that compelling for funders. Um, but technology advances required to do the physics have applications elsewhere. To hunt for the top quark, Fermilab needed to build the largest particle accelerator in the world, the Tevatron, requiring more than a thousand powerful superconducting magnets. To do this, scientists and engineers had to advance magnet technology and scale up manufacturing. And it was a really expensive undertaking uh, supported by government science funding, but in the end, it improved the performance of the magnets and drove down production costs, making the technology commercially viable. It's now in use in MRIs in hospitals all over the country, all over the world. So science funding led to technological advances that are now commonly used in medical devices that can help save people's lives and promote the general welfare of people. However, Bush also notes in his report that science by itself provides no panacea for individual social and economic ills. Uh, it can be effective in the national welfare only as a member of a team. That is, the science facts need to be considered in decision making and policy making process. Science needs a seat at the table for democracy to work and for economic gains to be made and the welfare of citizens to be protected. Not having a federal mask mandate a year ago was an opportunity lost. Though the coronavirus transmission is still being studied and understood, how many lives could have been saved if the government worked for the common good instead of divided, being divided by politics? We've passed a half million people dead from COVID-19 in the US. That's more than one out of every 700 people. That's just staggering. How many of these people could have been saved? And how many more people have been hospitalized? How many billions of dollars have we spent on healthcare when you know, we could have provided free masking stations across the country for much less. The science was there, the projections for various scenarios were made or, or could have been made, uh, but the science was not a member of the team and the welfare of our nation's citizens was not promoted or protected as it should be in our democracy. One way to ensure scientists have a seat at the table is for scientists to run for public office. As scientists, we advocate for research funding, for climate mitigation, for STEM education, and many other things. 
But until recently, not many scientists really even thought about running for public office. Um, so why did I run for school board? Um, well, it's a lot easier to be cynical and even despondent when the education secretary weakens school accountability and uh, strips uh, civil rights protections from students and when there are opportunity gaps in education throughout the country. But I decided to use my background as a scientist and educator to run for office and try to make a difference at the local level and give back to the district where my kids go to school. Um, this was in part, inspired in part by some of my colleagues in the physics community who won seats on city councils and park district boards before me. So when things are so divisive and polarized in our country, even at the local level, it's, uh, it's still critical that facts and data drive our decisions. And that's a place I think I can help and contribute. So in order for our democracy to survive and, and uh, progress, and in order to ensure the general welfare of everyone in the country, science also needs to progress and science needs a seat at the table. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, before I turn things to Dr. Leeson, just a reminder that if you have questions during any of the presentations, you can type them into the Q&A uh, panel on the right side of your screen. Okay, Dr. Leeson. Thank you. Um, the title of my presentation is Democracy and the Role of Ideologies. And ideologies have become increasingly important in our current political environment in the United States. And so I'm calling for a greater understanding of each other's ideologies and where we're all coming from. And we all value um, different things. Some, some groups value equality, others liberty, um, and our ideologies tend to reflect those values. But we have to also remember that we live in a pluralistic society with a variety of groups and interests and ideas, and we, you know, all have um, the rights to participate and express our ideas. So I want to begin with a definition of ideology. Um, there's four basic components to everyone's ideologies, and it's not just Americans, but uh, people throughout the world. Um, an ideology articulates one's attitude toward change. It provides explanations for our social, economic, and political conditions. It orients individuals in terms of their place in the world, and it does provide a guide for action. Do notice that this definition is not in terms of policy stances or political party membership. But this definition enables us to look at, at how all humans, Americans, Europeans, Asians, people throughout the world, approach their social and political situations. So for the context of you know, American politics right now, and just to narrow the scope of this talk, I'm just going to define uh, what conservatism is in general and liberalism as well. To begin, conservatism um, tends to seek a reduction in the uncertainty in the world and tries to reduce perceived threats. Those who um, adhere to conservatism tend to reject social change and try to justify social, political, and economic inequalities. Uh, those who adhere to conservatism tend to be pretty intolerant of ambiguity. Uh, these individuals are looking for structure, uh, order, and closure. They also tend to avoid social investment and the potential costs of exploitation by unrelated individuals. So those who tend to be more conservative tend to be a bit more socially insular. And then as, as individuals, those who are, tend to be conservative tend to be a bit more conscientious in terms of personality. In terms of liberalism, uh, those who adhere to liberalism tend to be more progressive and open to reform and innovation. They tend to advocate social and political and economic change in the world. They also seek greater equality. Those who tend to be liberal uh, tend to uh, accept the risks of social interactions with people outside of their communities or groups. And in terms of personality traits, these individuals tend to be rule breakers, risk takers, and pleasure seekers. 
So in my own research projects, um, I was working with a colleague last few years and we had this question, this research question that um, we were wondering, how do people develop their political ideologies? You know, how do they become liberal? Uh, in other words, wanting more change, or how do they become conservative, um, you know, preferring the status quo. And so we uh, went to evolutionary biology and looked at um, one theory in particular, which is life history theory. And uh, through a comparative uh, study bet between uh, participants in the United States and India, we wanted to see um, using this theory, how individuals' early life experiences informed the development of their political ideologies. So life history theory, this branch of evolutionary biology, analyzes patterns of growth, development, and the reproductions in species, including humans. Life history theory recognizes that natural selections influences on life stages of development within different environments um, you know, vary across, you know, within species and between species and different environments may be harsh, uh, short on resources, uh, individuals may experience uh, illness, disease, and even death. And we know from evolutionary theory that natural selection will favor those, you know, resource allocations that maximize one's survival and reproduction over the course of their lifetime. So life history theory in particular looks at how and why individuals allocate their limited resources. We all have limited time and energy, right? During the course of our lifetimes to maximize uh, reproductive success. Now, I want to just remind everybody that reproductive choices that individuals make are not necessarily conscious. You know, natural selection shapes our psychology as well as our physiology to be responsive to the environment so we can maximize uh, our fitness. And, but it's also important to remember as well that environments change and so individual choices change over the course of, of a lifetime. So we're not locked into um, any particular pattern or choices. So we found some that this theory has some new insights that um, it can bring to our understanding of um, human behavior and then eventually to ideology development. So life history theory and the evolutionary sciences can show how various environmental pressures, uh, and I'll talk about those in a minute, impact our cognition, our emotions, and our information processing, our brains, uh, as we uh, you know, grow and formulate our values and personalities and that eventually impacts the development of our ideologies. So on this next slide, it, this is a pretty good graphic that can show us you know, the connection between biology and ideology, but where it impacts, where these environmental uh, variables impact um, our, our cognitive, emotional, and, and, and brain development, right? And that informs our personality and our values. And then that then, informs our political ideology and notice way on the right is that you know that's where all these public opinion polls are asking about certain issues that's very specific and, and granular in this greater scheme of things so um environmental cues are incredibly important in the development of human uh cognition personality and eventually ideology and so some of the uh, environmental cues that impact people are resource availability that impacts um, our growth, uh, you know, our health in the future and our reproduction. Um, and throughout our entire development, our, our bodies and our brains are assessing our environments to, 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 to determine whether we have adequate food and shelter and safety, are our parents taking good care of us, things of that sort. You know, the environment is, you know, impacting our ability to discern if we uh, have a disability, disease, or experience death beyond our control, the death of those around us. Um, are we exposed to more violence, dangerous ecological conditions, et cetera? And then another cue, unpredictability. 
Uh, when we look at environmental unpredictability, we're talking about things that randomly change during your childhood in particular. Did, you know, did you move a lot as a child? You know, did you have harsh economic conditions? Did your parents lose their jobs? Did you have to move? Did you have a death of a parent in your family? Um, you know, were you neglected, abused? All of these are cues that um, are impacting your cognitive and emotional development. So in this graphic, we can see that um, all of these environmental cues lead to the development of either a fast or slow reproductive uh, strategy. Now, these are unconscious choices that are made in response to one's environment. Okay, so you can see on the left, uh, there's our fast strategies on the left are slow and they impact one's physiology. How, how early do you mature? How fast do you age? It impacts your mating behavior. Did you mature? Did you start dating very early? Did you have many sexual partners? Were you in just mono serially monogamous relationships? How are you as a parent? Did you become a parent early in your life? Did you have a lot of kids? Do you, do you, spend, do you invest a lot of your time and resources into each child? And then finally, in terms of personality, um, you know, we can look at reward orientation. Do you have a long term perspective on your life? Are you impulsive? Do you take more risks? Or are you more conservative? So, so we hypothesize that those who have a faster reproductive strategy uh, will tend to be more liberal, want more change. And those who are sl on the slow side would tend to be more conservative. Want, you know, want to maintain that status quo. So basically, um, what we're arguing in, in our project is that uh, early childhood experience uh, lead individuals to adopt political ideologies that should maximize their survival and reproductive success in their own environments. So individuals with those slow reproductive strategies would have conservative ideologies, um, and those with fast reproductive strategies exposed to more unpredictable, harsher environments um, would probably be more liberal. They're looking for more change. So in conclusion, hopefully, uh, you know, I want to say that we're all pursuing reproductive success in a variety of ways. Um, and, uh, and some strategies are more successful in some environments than in others. And, and I would argue that's part of our pluralism here in the United States. Um, all Americans are pursuing happiness in a variety of ways, emphasizing more equality or more liberty. Um, and as, as Americans, we do share common goals. We all want the good life in terms of health and safety, uh, good jobs, stable home, and, and overall just predictability and stability in our lives. And I, and I believe that if we remember this, we can better understand people's different strategies and their different ideologies, because we all share some common goals here. We're just taking different paths to get there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorette. And uh, thank all of you for their, your amazing, um, very concise contributions to this conversation. Um, again, um, so now we have about 30 minutes or so to talk. Um, ask uh, specific follow-up questions or discussion um, questions. I have a lot of questions I'd like to bring up. Um, and again, anyone who's uh, watching live can uh, type in a question to the Q&A as we go. And I guess maybe, uh, Loretta, I have a specific question for you to start, which is okay. just a follow-up question. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the difference between political ideology and party affiliation? It's kind yes. of part of one of those diagrams, but you know, just maybe well, go back um, to that. Political parties have specific functions. Um, they recruit candidates. They um, really delineate uh, various policy stances, and they want to run government. That's that's what parties do. Those are their three functions. And political ideologies stem really from you know more complex political philosophies. Um, they're much more simplified. You know, they, they tell us, um, you know, what the world's like, what it should be, what's wrong with it, how we need to change it, and how we are good members of our, you know, of the world. 
So you can have liberal, conservative ideologies. You can, uh, you know, feminism is an ideology. Environmentalism is an ideology, fascism, communism, Marxism. So they're, they're, they tend to be uh, much more simplified forms of broader political philosophies, but they definitely have components for political action. And then I just want to ask one more follow up question sure. to that. So if I understand correctly, the, um, there's a, you know, in American politics, there's a loose connection between political party affiliation and political ideology in very blunt simplistic ways so a conservative someone with a conservative um background in the way you described it makes a unconscious or semi-conscious decision to affiliate with a party connected to that ideology and i'm just curious if your research um takes into it like if how often do people switch those affiliate those party okay. affiliations and what does ideology have to do with those switches? Well, um, I think I, people do change parties. Um, you know, uh, my my grandfather, for example, used to be a Democrat, became a Republican, didn't like FDR. You know, uh, and we see too that parties change as well. And and Mark could attest to the changes in the Democratic Party throughout. Uh, um, Post-Civil War, um, the Republican Party has changed as well. And so, um, you know, these uh, uh, political ideologies um, can change for individuals and then parties change as well. So individuals can switch parties, but parties can uh, realign and join other people. And I know Mark could talk a lot about the changes of both the Democrat and Republican parties in the, in the 20th century and, you know, especially related to uh, voting and uh, race, et cetera. Mark, that sounds like an invitation for a brief. <laughs> sure. Uh, let me briefly throw two major transformation moments in. Um, uh, the Republican Party in the 19th century was by far more the reform party uh, of the two. Uh, you know, Whig Party disappears, the Republican Party rises up and basically draws in most of the Whig supporters. And so um, Lincoln, you know, was a reformer. Um, uh, the whole idea of Reconstruction was a reform movement to expand democracy. Uh, it shifts in 1912 uh, when Teddy Roosevelt doesn't win the nomination of the Republican Party for president, decides that he wants to take the marbles and go home and start his own party. And so he splits off really the most radical reformers of the Republican Party into the Progressive Party in uh, 1912 to run independently. Uh, so it's a three-way, actually four-way race because the Socialists got 10% of the vote that year too. It was a big, crazy, like, you know, really major options out there. And he, when he pulled them out, it left more conservative Republicans than the Republican Party. Um, Woodrow Wilson appealed to those people by moving more towards progressive reform, and he actually was able to shift the Democratic Party more towards uh, reform, gives us what uh, the, the Federal Reserve, you know, uh, act gives us uh, uh, direct election of senators, gets us, uh, you know, a progressive income tax, all kinds of major things come with Wilson. Um, and so they literally switched parties, I mean, like, 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 you know, personalities, the parties did, uh, with some people staying put, but many people actually leaving. Uh, the other major shift happened in the years after uh, the civil rights movement in the South, uh, when LBJ um, reached out to uh, uh, promote civil rights, right? Black votes, under segregation. And up until that time, the South had been heavily conservative democratic, right? Kind of out of step with the rest of the country. And he said this that we're going to lose the South for a generation. He was wrong. He, we're going to lose it for more than one generation. Uh, we're two generations, maybe going to three now. Um, so the South became Republican, uh, a different kind of Republican in some ways than the rest of the, the country. So there's been a lot of movement. Uh, those are just the two major transformations I can think of. 
that's so helpful and it also points out that kind of geographic element to it as well it's, it's uh, ideas and location which is i think part of lorette's um, thesis so we have a question from the audience and i'm going to read it out loud i'm not sure if you all if everyone can see it so i'll read it the, to what degree has the 24 7 news cycle contributed to our perhaps exacerbated or or exacer exacerbated our frequently uh, addressed our political polarization across America. So that is a question for everybody. I'll take the first crack at this one, I guess. Um, so I think that it has definitely exacerbated the uh, polarization. Um, you know, th th there's a, a lot more speculation, right? When, when you're just always on the kind of this loop, um, there's a lot more speculation that jumps in. There's um, more uh, analysis and spin that, that is able to, to jump in. Um, so uh, I think it, it does um, you know, lead to a lot more uh, of the polarization. And now you, you have uh, specific channels that are um, you know, tuned toward particular uh, you know, part, types of spin, right? Uh, you have the Fox News, you have the CNBC, you have uh, you know, uh, all, all kinds of um, kind of special interest, uh, you know, commentary going on. So um, I think uh, it, it has uh, definitely increased the polarization um, a, a across the country and, and um, you know, e even locally, um, you know, when, when we're dealing with uh, things on a smaller scale and, and smaller uh, scales of government. Yeah, I, I would add to what Joe said that these major news stations are also corporately owned. Um, certain corporations have their own agendas. Fox News in particular has a very conservative agenda and has for decades. Um, and it's also for profit. And these news stations have to bring people back night after night with, you know, the drama of you know, the day. And so you have, um, you know, ideologically founded and directed news media, and you also have, um, you know, some spin, uh, some misinformation, speculation, uh, lots of commentary, especially during prime time, you're not getting a lot of factual information. And, and you know, and, and, and it creates these echo chambers where, you're hearing the same perspectives over and over again every night. If you're tuning into the same folks uh, every night, they're reinforcing your political ideology. They're they're telling you what the world's like. They're telling you what you should be doing, uh, what the problems are as they see it, and they just reinforce uh, people's predilections to a certain ideology. The challenge for Americans is to, you know, try to find the time to look at various sources. I encourage my students to read the news and not watch the news because you'll get the who, what, where, and most importantly, why questions answered. You're not gonna necessarily get a, 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 a factually based uh, explanation during prime time on any of these stations. I'm totally on board with Lorette. Uh, I don't like watching the news very much at all. Um, the, you know, I mean, I, I still remember Walter Cronkite, right? So, you know, that was all my family would get of news, a tiny little bitty local paper and Walter Cronkite every night, um, which kind of unified the country, listening to him. And that was it. When the news was over, it was over, right? And you went on for the rest of your day. And now we have this prol proliferation of places we can go for news and get into doom scrolling or rage scrolling or whatever it is. You know, you only look at the other side when you want to get really angry and, you know, you listen to your side because you know you're right and, you know, you won't have your beliefs challenged. Um, I think a lot of this became a problem in the late 80s when we changed rules about uh, fair and balanced use of airtime. Uh, the airways were seen as a public resource for decades, uh, just like any other resource that had to be used responsibly. And then we changed the rules and said, you don't have to have uh, balanced news programming anymore. And the very next year, Rush Limbaugh, who just died right, a couple of days ago, went on the air uh, nationally for the first time. And we had this movement towards um, intentionally biased news, right? That's not biased by accident. 
And then the left tries to do it with MSNBC and I don't think they do a very good job with it, um, but trying to get biased back. So you have like four, you know, liberals and one conservative, you know, that they all make fun of for the whole hour. And, you know, you know, you're not getting news. Um, so yeah, it less, the less TV news you get, I think, and radio news, the better off you're probably gonna be. Thank you all. Um, I guess I just wanna say, this is not a question, maybe just a comment. I get to assert my thought here. The I'm thinking about this is really about two things. One is about getting fact-based information, um, which you know, as, as as you all have pointed out, there are sources for that, but it's a little harder to get to sometimes in the current media landscape. Um, but maybe something that's even missing equally is a mo models of people who disagree with each other having conversations about the ideas. And I do think there was a little bit of, of that in the in the news, you know, firing line or whatever things like that in the in the past. I hate to be nostalgic about the past because there are all kinds of problems with that as well. But but I I just think there's very I don't know if you have any reflections on that, but that seems to be what's missing. And it, it triggered that thought, Mark, when you said that you know there's this four to one ratio on the two different channels that are reversed is, is some sort of parody of discussion um but there isn't really people listening to each other on tv and what their what their ideas are so i don't know if you have any if you don't have any comments about that okay. real quick yeah i know chris my real quick my one exception to tv news is uh the news hour on pbs and fridays are when most of us like to watch it because you got to see for decades right brooks and shields um true conservative true liberal and they truly loved each other and i i always loved their their uh election coverage because whoever one that night would always reach out and kind of pat the other guy and you know i know this is hard you know and i feel for you and it just sometimes it brought me to tears right that sense of mm, you're you're also an american and i care about you and you want good for your country you just see things differently uh it might make us all better to watch more uh news hour agreed i agree i love that um the so here's a question of sorts it's sort of maybe like a brainstorming topic um i just wonder you know so we've we've established that voting is a key way to participate in democracy um and joe in particular brought up other ideas around um you know contributing knowledge essentially to decision makers in power um i just wonder if we could just kind of all think together a little bit about what are other ways people participate or do democracy um in their in their lives as citizens and i think we've established that sitting on the couch and watching cable news is not one of those things <laughs> <laughs> i can start uh I, you know if you're watching cable news i would recommend that you watch something else or especially read something else but being a, a, an active civically engaged citizen requires you to understand what's going on and and getting your news uh, we talk about it a lot in uh, our poli sci classes, uh, especially in the gen eds, about the various ways uh, citizens are engaged. And it can be by joining an interest group. It can be by volunteering in your community. And a lot of times when you're volunteering, say, at a food pantry, you are, you know, helping not just your community, but also the government deal with the policy problem of food insecurity. So there's so many volunteer activities that have a, a, a civic uh, aspect to it. Um, you can run for office, you can volunteer for a campaign. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, Joe ran for office. He is the most civically engaged person on this panel, I think, and, and he's to be commended. So he can talk about um, the most intense type of civic engagement from a very personal experience. Yeah, it, it's very intense to, <laughs> to run for public office. Um, and, and there are much easier ways to get, get in, involved, right? Um, call up your uh, representative, you know, write a, type a letter to your, um, send an email uh, to your representative. Um, you know, like Lorette said, get, get involved in uh, different groups, special interest groups, um, you know, find your passion and advocate for it. 
Um, you know, that's the most important thing. Uh, you know, as elected officials, we represent the constituency and we need to know what's on your mind, right? And um, some of those emails are hard to read at times, um, but, you know, we, we need to know, uh, you know, what people are thinking and, and uh, what the community uh, is uh, thinking. Um, yeah, getting involved in a, so I, I had never volunteered on a campaign. I, I just kind of went in <laughs> not knowing what I was getting myself into. Um, volunteer on a campaign before you jump in, uh, you know, learn, learn things before you jump in, uh, you know, don't, don't do it on the fly. It, it worked, but, um, you know, it was tough. I, I had a very steep learning curve. Um, and it, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, and uh, as an introvert, you know, an introvert scientist, it, um, it is very difficult, uh, to, to go knocking on people's doors and saying, please vote for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations again uh, on that accomplishment. Um, and I based on a little experience I have in, in participating in these things, I, I think sometimes the local politics are, are maybe even more intense and personal in a way. So I can kind of imagine what you're um, experiencing there with those emails. Um, so, I wanted just really quickly. Oh, I, I oh please, yeah, go ahead, Mark. But, uh, no, just very briefly, yeah, I think we've got a real obligation to start trying to find ways to rebuild community at the local level. You know, I mean, and so we tend to cluster our friends around our own identity and we've got a lot of healing to do in America. And I think finding people who we disagree with, but who we respect because of what they do with their lives is a place to start in, in finding people that we can listen to, uh, who can we can respect and start, you know, re knitting a sense of, of interconnectedness. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, another question from the from the uh, viewers: um, Will identity politics ultimately serve to reinforce or undermine the solid principles of self governance promised within a democratic model? Rhett, do you want to try that? <laughs> or any of you? I, I feel like I've, <laughs> people are deferring to the theorists. You know, um, yes. <laughs> and that's fine. Well, you know, it, my thoughts on that is, you know, related to ideologies because, uh, you know, individuals have their identity and they they have certain groups that they tend toward, right? And and I think, you know, related to what Mark had said, we, we need to lay these foundations for political civility. We need to Go, you know, get out of our bubbles, get out of our echo chambers and listen to other people. And, you know, people, especially who have different public, you know, political opinions or ideologies from you are the people you're going to learn the most from. And, you know, just from my own experience, too, I mean, there, there's been ideologies that I've studied that, you know, I didn't agree with and, you know, definitely heard all the negative sides from it from my politically intense family over you know the course of my lifetime but from my experience it was learning those other ideologies that um made me not only appreciate my own but better understand where they were coming from and actually see you know the value that they bring to our conversations about politics or the value they bring to our understanding of why systems aren't working you know people just have to wander out and be be brave enough to let their own ideas be challenged. And, and that takes some political courage. I'd like to ask what identity politics means. Um, because, you know, Irish folk getting off the boat voted Democratic uh, 150 years ago. Southern planters voted one party. Workers, you know, in factories voted another party. At some level, from George Washington's administration on, people gravitated towards parties that represented their position in society. Um, I wonder sometimes if identity politics is this new word that we use to talk about the surprise that black folks are suddenly voting in large numbers because they weren't allowed to when I was born. 
uh, you know, growing up in the South. Um, if that's what we mean by it, well, uh, what's different about that identity compared to other kinds of identities that have helped people figure out where they stand politically? I guess I'm a little confused. Yeah, great, great question. You know, and we'll sit with that one a little bit. I think it's maybe harder when one thought quickly before I, I well, I want to go from that question to a related question in my mind, which is how do we, and it really, be, it really harks back to, to Mark, to your very first story you told and to some of the comments that Joe made about science being represented in decision-making. And I just kind of want to ask how, what determines influence in our democracy? And, and you know, Mark, you talked a ton about, you know, different qualifiers for voting. Um, and then, and then there's, and then we've, we've kind of touched on other uh, to exert privilege and power, you know, and sometimes that's because of, um, uh, you know, unearned uh, privilege and sometimes it's because of uh, expertise. I guess I've, I'm just gonna lump those two things together. Um, and, you know, decision makers need expertise. And so there's an unequal influence um, across the whole spectrum of, of, of decision of, you know, the influence on decision making. Um, and so I just wonder if anybody, and I would even maybe throw in another thing because we're running out of time, which is even the people who are active in the way we just talked about it have much more influence than people who are not active. Um, people who write Joe emails have more power than the people who don't. Um, so anyway, I just wonder if, if, I know there's a 15 questions in there, but if you can just kind of reflect on on the range of the way, what the expression, who should be at the table, <laughs> might mean. Well, I can start, and, and it gets gives me the opportunity to talk about Plato. So I'm excited about that. Because Plato talked about power and who should lead and um, who is qualified, you know? And he, he was dealing with forces uh, such as Callicles and, and the dialogue, the Gorgias, who truly believe that might made right. The strong should rule, they should be able to do whatever they want, pursue any pleasures they want, etc. Uh, not dissimilar to what we're dealing with today with uh, the over influence of wealth and money in, in our elections and in lobbying, etc. Um, but you know, Plato really believed that expertise was needed to lead. And uh, he tried to make the argument, and you could say perhaps unsuccessfully, that, you know, philosopher kings were the best, but they, they you know, operated in the world of truth and knowledge, fact knowledge, like Joe talked about, but they also were concerned about, um, you know, making sure they can explain their methodologies as to why they are making decisions or, or, or leading in a certain way, but most importantly, they were leading for the common good. You know, and that's when you know someone is is truthful with you, right? As a politician, you know, are they dealing with knowledge or facts? Can they give you the source of those knowledge and facts? And are they are they really trying to do what's best for everybody? And not just the wealthy, and not the, just themselves. And and so it's so easy in a democracy for that kind of message to be lost to the flashier, the wealthier, you know, leaders or messengers or candidates out there. And and it's just so hard. And the majority of people want to hear what they want to hear. You know, what feels good, what make, what reinforces their ideology what protects their pocketbook, et cetera. So it's quite quite a challenge thousands of years later. Okay. Oh, that answered all those questions. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> it's very impressive, Brett. Um, Mark and Joe, do you wanna to add to that? And I, I have maybe one last question. Joe, you first. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll just jump in quick. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, they're, Different groups of people vote in different proportions. We're never going to lose Social Security because old folks vote. You know, they just do it. 
Young folk don't, all you young folk watching this. And so politicians don't have to listen to you so much. Um, and then there's groups that don't vote for no, you know, fault of their own, right? You work long, long hours, don't have a driver's license, it's harder. If you, you know, are a felon after you served your time in many, many states, votes taken away from you, even though you paid your debt to society. Um, and then we get the question of, you know, how much should money be involved in um, uh, powering a person's individual voice democratically, right? We have Citizens United that recently said that that giving as much money as you want to to a politician is the same thing as free speech, uh, which Teddy Roosevelt, my favorite, you know, Republican uh, uh, reformer, uh, he's the first one to, you know, set limits on campaign donations, right? And so now we can buy our politicians. So that clearly is a different kind of uh, democratic empowerment that some people have relative to others. Yeah, I, I agree with what um, Mark and Lorette said. You know, the, I think there are a lot of special interest groups out there now. Um, again, with a lot of money and a lot of power. Um, you know, the, the unfortunately, a lot of it is going to you know the the people who can spend the most are most likely to succeed in, in uh, a lot of the elections, especially in the primary elections. Um, you know, so you know it's not necessarily representative uh, of the people. But yeah, Joe, thank you. you. So oh, I was oh, gonna go say, ahead, Laura. Joe, you knocked door to door and you won. You know, you were <laughs> right. engaged. I mean, people, yeah. you know, you do need money, but you also need the energy and the passion to reach out to folks. And, you know, not every, you know, primary is won by the wealthiest. It's by the one who's got the message that resonates with their constituents. Uh, I think at the local level, uh, you can yeah. still, you know, go door to door. You can still, you know, meet the, the people. Uh, it's more once you get to state level and national level that it uh, becomes much more uh, money driven. Right. I just have one more question. Our time is almost up and it's, um, hopefully a little more positive than my last question um the uh i just want you to all just quickly answer like what are you hopeful for about democracy going forward did i say that clearly hopeful what are you hopeful about um in relationship to democracy going forward i'll be real brief i guess john lewis who's been my Hero, you know, my, my favorite living American up until this past summer when he died, said that he was given hope for American democracy by seeing how broad the coalition of people standing on street corners uh, arguing that black folks should be given the same kinds of civil rights protections that white folks have, and that that made him more hopeful than he'd ever been. It's good enough for John Lewis. That works for me. Joe, Lorette? I'm a political scientist. It's hard to be hopeful sometimes, um, but I am hopeful. I'm, I, I am hopeful, you know, for a future that's not here in America where the politics and the temperature has come down a bit, that there's, you know, more discussions of, you know, all of us just, you know, using the language of unity and America as, as a whole, um, that's making me hopeful. So. I think one of the things that is making me hopeful is actually the engagement of the youth, this, uh, especially this summer. Um, you know, that there was, it, it was much more active, uh, many more younger people uh, engaging in, in uh, activism and politics. Um, you know, I, I think that's going to impact the future um, and I think it will impact it in a positive way. Yes, uh, engagement of younger people in politics, in civic life, in community is, is really palpable and, and noticeable and I hope it translates into votes, um, voting over time. And also I'll just say that universities are places where um, 
young people sometimes, uh, people of all ages, but certainly generations of young people and brilliant people like the three of you come together. So I have great hope around both what, how universities can be models for the type of dialogue that we were talking about earlier and the uh, um, you know, idealism and positive, uh, the spirit of positive change that, that young people are bringing to these issues. So on that note, I just wanna thank all three of you. It takes a lot of time to prepare for these and, and I really, you know, you're very busy people working, teaching, um, doing research, going to school board meetings. So I, I really appreciate the time and, and the, the brilliant insights. And our, I know our, our community does as well, our audience and the people who will be watching this going forward. So thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Thanks Chris White for your um, enormous help with putting this together to Joe uh, Glatz and to everyone in events and conferences, Julie Penner and so on who uh, uh, made this possible um, in uh, uh, immense gratitude. And so everyone have a great night and uh, we will see you soon at our next event. Take care, bye-bye.